Hi, it's Matthew Reed here from How to Repair Pendulum Clocks. On page 12 of our book, How to Repair Pendulum Clocks, Volume 1 Getting Started, we talk about removing the quarter inch across flats brass nuts from your Smith's Enfield mantle clock without marking. And we suggest that you use a ring spanner or like this, uh, a socket spanner. Now this is absolutely fine, although the socket spanner is a little bit clumsy for a job like this. I thought it would be really great fun to make some small brass spanners. Now, of course, nobody needs to go and make a spanner. You can go online or go to the shop and buy one. But the point of this exercise was really to introduce our readers to some bench craft techniques. There's an inextricable link between new making, craft practice, historic craft practice, and clock repair. Now, I don't have a milling machine. I don't have a big kind of lathe for a clockwork. So I thought it would be useful here to show as many techniques as possible, including hardening, tempering, annealing, using a jeweler saw, different kinds of files, measuring, marking, drilling, and so on. So let's get to it. This is what we made. It's a piece of two millimeter thick brass with a screwdriver filed on one end and um, a quarter inch across flats, a hexagonal hole on the other end. Uh, this is a nice little tool to use. And of course the beauty of it is it minimizes marking to the clock plate or the brass nuts. You can see, by the way, I used a bit of scrap brass or brass from an old project, hence the engraving on some of these tools. So in order to make that hexagonal hole, I want to make this repeatable so I can make multiple units here. I looked around and decided that the best way to get a quarter inch across flats hexagonal hole would be to use a hexagonal Allen key. Now, um, an Allen key or hex wrench is actually slightly smaller than these nuts. These nuts are about 6.4, 6.5 millimeters. So I couldn't use a quarter inch Allen key. I had to use the next size up, which is seven millimeters. And I'm sure there are much kind of cleverer ways of doing this, but I wanted a piece of steel that I could harden and temper to make this brooch. Now I've used this technique before for making tapered clock keys for 17th, 18th and 19th century clocks. So it's an incredibly useful thing to make if you want to make a reasonably high precision hole and particularly if you want to make it repeatable. So here's our seven millimeter across flats Allen key or hex wrench. And this turned out to be a really high quality piece of steel. The next thing I wanted to do was to lose the corner. I only want the straight bit of the Allen key. So I thought I would be able to saw through it, which actually proved really difficult. Yeah, if I had an angle grinder, I could use a cut off disc or something, but I don't, and I don't want the dust and mess in the workshop. So I took a hacksaw and started to saw through, and it turned out to be a really tough bit of material. I just didn't want to heat up the whole thing to anneal it. So my hacksaw blade got blunted, and I got frustrated with it, so I turned to brutal measures and snapped the end of the key off one side sawn about halfway through. Once I've got rid of the uh, curved bit of the Allen key, I'm going to anneal it. So I'm gonna heat it up to bright orange and I'm gonna hold it there for 10 minutes and I'm gonna allow it to cool really slowly. This hopefully will soften the material enough. Now this kind of complex tool steel that these hex wrenches are made from doesn't anneal that easily. Ideally, you would put it in an oven or you would start with a kneel stock, but I don't have those opportunities. So this is very much kind of home made stuff. So I arrange my uh, mini hearth and get the gas on and find that one of the blow torches I have doesn't have enough heat to heat the whole thing up. So I then move on to two and after a while I get the heat into it. 
allow it to soak and then allow it to cool slowly. Um, I'm going to use a homemade centre punch here and a pair of dividers. Now those tools needed sharpening first so I'm using this 1000 grit ceramic stone and I begin by drawing the centre punch along the stone away from the tip and rotating it at the same time. If you push the centre punch towards the tip inevitably it'll dig in a little bit and you'll never get it that sharp. I'm using this ceramic stone because it keeps the tip nice and cool. If you use a grinding wheel, then it's, there's every chance it'll get too hot and the tip will be softened and the whole process is pointless. Now you can tell when the tool is getting sharp enough by just resting it on your thumb or fingernail at an angle. If the tool digs in under its own weight, then it's probably sharp enough. If the tool slips off, then it needs more sharpening. So I continue doing this for the centre punch first and then secondly for my pair of dividers until they're both sharp. So I take my piece of uh, brass sheet, I'm using leftover sheet from an old project so it's already engraved on one side and we'll see that in the finished tools but that's quite cool. So the first thing to do is to mark on with the centre punch not by hammering but just by pressing it into the metal. That should leave enough of a divot so you can get your dividers in there. I want the I want the circles I'm going to mark to be about half an inch in diameter so I set my dividers on an engraved steel rule at quarter of an inch. So into the hole that we've just pressed into the brass we can draw our circle and because the dividers are quite sharp we get um, a single nice defined line. The next stage is to find again that center and because there's a single mark there it's quite easy and I am going to use a light hammer to increase the size of the divot. Then I'm going to use a drill in a pin vise to open the hole even more. I'm going to drill undersized to form a pilot hole then drill to size. So the size I'm working up to here is about the across flat size of the hexagon we're going to use. So this is just to remove the majority of material before we use our new drift. Be extra cautious when drilling cheap brass like this. It should always be clamped down because the drill has got a tendency to grab. In fact, you can modify the drill for drilling brass sheet. And I can show you that in another video if anybody's interested. Or you can buy drills that are already ground specifically for drilling brass. So there we are. We've got our across flats size drilled in our sheet of brass and it's time to go back to our Allen key. It's now cooled down. I'm just going to tidy up the end with a file. And I want to tidy up the surfaces of flats to remove any oxide. So I take a 1000 grit ceramic stone in this case because I don't want any rounding 
don't use abrasive paper. Abrasive paper really isn't of any interest to me or very little interest to me in new making because it almost inevitably causes rounding. One of the foundation stones of horological manufacture is crisp angular detail. This is why I really don't like abrasive paper. So I'm using this uh, abrasive stone, which is much flatter, and then do a few calculations. So the actual across flat size of the Allen key is just under seven millimeters, and I want to take it down to about 6.45 millimeters. So I find out what the difference is between those two values, then divide that by two, that tells me the amount of material I need to remove. So I set my caliper at the target size and zero it. This means that when we measure the material, we can see exactly how much we need to remove. We don't have to do any kind of further calculation. You can see here how much material we've got to remove. So we're going to get to it. I clamp the hex stock in the vise and making sure I don't file down onto the vise jaws because that would ruin the file, I begin slowly taking material off. Now I don't want this to be parallel, I want it to be slightly tapered so I can drive this tool that we're making through the brass. Once I've filed and filed along the length to keep the whole thing flat. I stone a little bit, then I measure, I work on to the next flat, I stone, I file along the length of the material, stone and measure, and so on, until I've filed three sides down to a taper to our target size. Now I have to reset my caliper because I'm going to file down to just above final size. I want to leave about 0 0.05 or thereabouts millimetres on so I can stone that down to my final size. So I reset and carry on with the filing. Again this three stage, removing the kind of bulk of material, then filing along the length to smarten things up, and then a little bit of stoning. Another thing you can do here if you want to file or stone something flat is to put uh, centers on the work like this. And this is just a little demonstration and make up a frame here. I'm just very quickly using the jaws of the bites. And this is analogous to a swing tool that will be used in horology or historic making to make sure that the work and the file in this case stay absolutely flat. It's an incredibly useful technique. Now I'm happy that I've got my high point where the two converging tapered hexagons meet and it's marked here in blue. I'm going to start relieving the corners of our tool. And again, I do it in the same way. I start by filing with a coarse file, then move on to a finer file and then do a bit of stoning. I'm using a black Sharpie pen here so I can see where I've filed. I don't have engineers marking blue and that actually might be uh, better. So now we've got our double tapered hexagon with the edges relieved. I'm going to start filing the cutting surfaces. Here I'm using a barrette file. A barrette file is an incredibly useful file 
but work like this because you can get into really sharp corners. In the video that immediately follows this one, I'll show you the files I've used in this process. So you can see with the barrette file, we're just basically making little triangular uh, teeth, if you like, with flat faces, and then I'm undercutting them ever so slightly to make sure that they're sharp. Once I've done one side, I rotate the tool and roughly using the teeth I've just made as a guide, I continue in the same manner, round one, two, three, four, five, and six sides. Now when I file the teeth, I'm leaving a tiny land, so I'm leaving a bit of the existing surface there, which will make sure that the tool stays to dimension, but also that those two tips are actually quite strong. So that's one side done. There we are, there's our tool we've finished filing. Now it looks quite rough, but remember the filed bit you can see here is only relief. The bit we're interested in are the actual lands or the cutting edges of the tool, which are part of that original tapered hexagon. So remembering that we've annealed this piece of material, we need to harden it again so I'm going to use the same little half system, but I need to be able to get hold of the steel once it's up to temperature and plunge it into cold water. So to do that, I make a little holder out of mild steel wire or iron binding wire as it's called. And there we are. So again, like the annealing process, we're going to bring this tool up to bright orange. We're going to hold it there for about five minutes in this case, and then we're going to plunge it immediately, vertically, into cold water and agitate it immediately. So there are three points there. Once the tool is up to temperature and it's soaked with heat, move it immediately to the cold water don't allow it to cool at all. The second thing is that plunge it vertically so it reduces the chance of distortion. And the third point is make sure that as soon as it goes in the water, you agitate it. Otherwise the tool will be surrounded by a blanket or cushion of steam and that will prevent cooling and therefore prevent hardening. So the moment of truth, we'll take off our binding wire, which incidentally has gone brittle, so I wonder whether it's absorbed some carbon either from the gas or from the charcoal block on which it was resting. And then we test the tool uh, with a file just to hear that it's hard. If you want to practice this, just take a piece of very hard tool steel and take a annealed bit of material and learn the difference in the sound. The file just skids off with this very kind of high sort of pitch sound. And now I'm going to again use in a stone and not abrasive paper, just going to remove some of the oxide so we can see the lands that were left on there and the working surface of the tool. So in order to um, temper this tool, it's very hard now, so if we to use it and strike it with a hammer, which we are going to do to make those hexagonal holes, then it might be that uh, it would shatter. So we want to temper the tool. 
So tempering is reducing the hardness and increasing the toughness. The more you temper, the tougher the steel gets, but the softer it gets. There's always a kind of sweet spot. And we decide how tempered we want this thing. Are we can judge the temperature without the kiln. The kiln would be very useful, but by looking at the temper colours. So as you heat hardened steel very, very slowly, you'll see that first it turns very pale yellow, which people call pale straw, then medium yellow, then dark yellow, brown, purple, blue, pale blue, whitish grey. They're the temper colours. And if you work on a clock spring, for instance, an old clock spring, you see that's tempered to blue. We don't want our tool to be as springy as a clock spring. We want to retain as much hardness as we dare get away with, but we also don't want it to shatter. So I'm going to temper this to dark straw, so that's a kind of somewhere between yellow and medium brownish kind of colour. So I do that by, again, returning to our mini half, uh, but this time with the gas, we use the laziest flame possible. That is a very low flame, and we heat slowly because we want the heat to penetrate the tool, and we want all the tool, in this case, to heat up evenly. You will see, as we progress, the steel very, very slowly begins to turn pale yellow. Now we know at that stage that we were really nearly where we want to stop. So I'm going super slow now, and when I get up to what I think is mid-straw, I stop the heating and just allow the tool to cool very slowly. So now the moment of truth, is the tool going to work? I make a wooden block with a hole in it to support the brass sheet and take my hammer and simply drive it through. Yes, is the answer. It seems to work. Yay! Great. We can now make a large number of those reasonably precise hexagonal holes, an amount of repeatability that is easy once you've made the tool. So once we've made our hexagonal holes, I'm going to mark out the sheet and again sharpen my scriber just in the same way I did with the center punch and the dividers drawing the tool towards me at about an angle of 35 degrees or something and rotating it at the same time and again I use the thumbnail test to check that it's sharp. 
I've used red marking here, again a pen, not engineer's blue, which was not a good idea. Use blue, not red, because of the contrast. I'm now going to rough out the brass tools, and I started with a hacksaw. You may remember my hacksaw blade got trashed, sawing through the hex wrench, so we're investing in a new blade here. But actually, doing it quickly, it was a bit rough, and I wasn't particularly happy with that. It was absolutely fine. I didn't quite go over the line. Um, but for the next tools, I decided to use a jeweler saw. So I used the piercing saw table and piercing saw. And it's actually, with this free cutting brass, didn't take that long. It was easy, it was more meditative, it was more controlled. It was a much more enjoyable experience than just hacking it out with a hacksaw. So now it's time to straighten up the sides of the little tools that we're making. So I get the file in tension and I'm working kind of on top of the tool here and I flat out the sides. As you can see, it's really quick um, if you can keep the file under control. Easier said than done maybe for beginners, but just go for it. Just get a piece of scrap material but just go for it. That's why making a tool like this is so, is so great because you build up all those motor skills in the process without damaging old clocks, basically. So once I've roughed out the sides, I test them maybe on the jaws of the vise to check that they're reasonably square. Then I run the file along the length, a kind of draw filing of the tool to make it nice and smart. To round the ends, I'm going to use my piercing saw table and run the file round. This is just to get them roughed out, remember. And then I'm going to file the faces flat as well to get rid of the kind of rolled finish on the brass. If you struggle to hold pieces of material like this, then you can always pin them down onto your piercing saw table, which makes life easy. So now I've got the edges, ends and faces roughed out. I'm just going to finish the end with a three square escapement file.
I'm going to bevel the edges of the hexagon with the same file just to make it look smart. I'm going to do a little cheat here with a scalpel blade just to make the corners of that hexagon look really smart and well defined. And then I'm going to bevel the edges and make the screwdriver blade. Now, as I said before, one of the foundations of horological manufacture is crisp angular detail. And I'll say it again, this is why I don't want to use abrasive paper on any of this making project, because that'll just leave everything squidgy and rounded. Filing's quick and relatively easy once you get, uh, once you practice, and you can end up with some really smart looking components. So I'm using a cork block here just for the kind of final finishing. So the file and the tool that we're making can move together. And again, this is to avoid rounding. So there we are, let's test our tool and it works great and we're all done. So to summarize, of course, this wasn't about making a spanner. It was about employing craft skills, about sharpening tools, about hardening, tempering, annealing. If there's any of these processes you want me to go into more in more detail, then please leave a comment below and we'll do that in future videos. The next video is gonna be about the files I used in this video. So thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and we will see you again.